Better? Better if I cut it on? Yep. A little bit. Is that too loud? They'll adjust it. They'll figure it out. Hey, real quick, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we are so thankful, and we are so grateful that uh, we get to be together, um, you doing exactly what you've asked us to do, to meet together in your name, that we would hear your word, learn your word, honor your word, honor you, learn to serve, learn to give, learn to be in community, learn responsibility, learn accountability. Father, all of those things are why we meet. And in all of those things, we pray that you receive honor and glory. Today, we're here to hear from your word. I pray that I'll faithfully communicate it. You will help us to hear it. I pray, Lord God, that only you give eyes and ears and hearts that can see and hear and understand. I pray that you would do that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. What's up? Y'all doing good? Hey, glad to see everybody. Y'all not feeling it. So here we go. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Um, I was talking to a guy uh, last week. Uh, We were talking about sharing our faith and a couple of things like that. By the way, just to let you know, this is the John, the Apostle John, who ran really fast and uh, and, uh, actually outran Peter when he found out that the tomb might be empty, and he outran him. Peter, of course, the one when they finally got to the tomb was like, we got here, but I'm the only one just going to jump in real quick. So he he, uh, jumped in, but he's that John. He's the John that we talked about when we spoke about the book of Revelation. He's the John that was uh, sent to the island of Patmos. He's the John known as the one whom uh, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. He's the John who is the one that Jesus said, Mary, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. Uh, He's the John that was the only one at the foot of the cross. I just kind of want you to know who we're talking about, right? And so in John chapter 20, uh, that's where we're going to be. We're going to be talking about doubt, right? So doubt's a big deal uh, because a lot of times for us as Christians, we believe doubt is a bad thing. Uh, matter of fact, as Christians, a lot of us don't um, want to talk about some of the doubts we have. There's some of you right now, there's no doubt about it, that if I were to really ask you to be honest, you would have some doubts. Uh, it might be some doubts about Christianity. It might be some doubts about, uh, um, you know, your faith. Uh, it might be doubts about, can God ever use me? Maybe doubts like, has, has God not ever used me? Will he ever use me? Can I be used? Have I messed up too much? Can God forgive somebody like me? Does God love me? Does God care about me? Is God interested in me? Um, am I saved? Do I have any faith at all? Am I in the faith at all? All of those things or doubts that every single Christian has. And we sometimes say that that's wrong to have them. But here's the deal. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. Because doubt is saying, I'm struggling, and I may be looking for a reason out of the faith or a reason to know more about the faith, but unbelief is I don't have the faith and I won't have the faith. It's different. And so I want us to really kind of understand what it is, but here's the importance of it. Everybody has doubts, and it's either going to be a killer or a catalyst. It just depends on what you do with it. And we're in a world that does this deconstruction where all of a sudden their parents made them go to church, and they do not have a faith of their own. They just do it because they're in South Louisiana. They do it because their parents make them go. They do it because it's familiar. They do it because they think that's just what they should. They do it for all those reasons. They even have an affection for it or a desire for it. But they have these doubts, these real doubts about it. And when the doubts come in and the way that they handle it, They end up walking away from the faith and what they call deconstruction. And what I want to do is I want to help us today to say doubting's okay. I encourage it. I really encourage some doubt. But you have to take that doubt and do something productive with it like we'll see in the text. So there are things that I doubt though. Um, I have doubts, things that I just really struggle with. Like uh, there's some evidence that this is something I should believe in, but like whatever. So um, a couple of doubts, uh, these guys. Um, 
I don't know, man. Uh, people are like, man, do you believe in aliens? Whatever. Here's my thoughts. Um, yeah, if you want to know, I do. I don't know that he looks like that. Uh, and one thing, uh, I'm not a weirdo. Like, I don't think like he's at the front yard or anything. Uh, I just think out of this huge universe, there's probably something else. Here's what I do believe. There's no way they arrived here. And they probably don't look like that. And I don't even know why they would come here. If the universe is that big and that cool, I can't imagine this way they arrived. So, but I have my doubts, especially it looks like that. Um, something else, uh, I really doubt this. Uh, I don't believe in horoscopes or astrology. Any of y'all, you know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all, like, first of all, it's forbidden. Just want you to know in the Bible. But people will say dumb stuff to me like, you know, um, are you an Aquarius? I'm like, what? You call me? Like, I don't even, I don't even know what that means. Uh, and then, like, uh, somebody the other day, I was talking to him, and, like, I'm very different. So, uh, I, I don't know why I know this, but I know it. Does anybody know if you're a Leo or not? I'm a Leo. All right, oh. <laughs> All right whatever. All right, so here's the deal. I was talking to somebody the other day. I'm completely opposite then. And they were like, you're a Leo. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, man, we're all just alive. I'm like, no, we're not. Like, Leos sound tough. Like, they could do something. I'm like the most unmasculine man you're going to run into. And so I was like, I don't know about that. They don't really believe in it. This thing, um, uh, I actually I have doubts. I don't know if you know who that is. Y'all know who that is? That's Nessie. And here's what I know about Nessie is that if a dinosaur was like in a lake, with all the technology, in the, I feel like we'd find him. Like, I just feel like we'd find him. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I don't, I do not believe that that thing's in a lake. And if he was in that lake, he's no longer in that lake. Uh, so I don't know why people are looking at that lake. Um, all right, maybe this, that guy. Um, he's real, by the way. I just put him up there to convince you he's real. Um, the, uh, I think it's great because I feel like by looking at him, I can tell he's wearing a mask. It's what it looks like. Like his eyes coming through. I have doubts about that guy. Um, so I don't know what I think about that. Uh, the next one. <sighs> Could be. Could be. Uh, I don't. Shh. Here's what I know. Here's. Shh. None of you know for sure. Could be that. You don't know, but I have my doubts. I'll tell you one thing I doubt tremendously. I don't understand it. I don't believe in it. It's probably this. Uh, there's no way. No way that's real. There's, there's no way that's real. Because that guy's way too good looking for that girl. All day long, he could do better. Shh. All right. Shh. All right. Shh. Shh. All right. Does anybody else think he looks like Thor, right? Okay. All right. Shh. All right. Shh. Quiet, quiet, quiet. All right. But here's the thing about doubt, a couple of things that I, I want us to look at. The reality is we do. Everybody does. But I do believe that as much as doubt can be productive, God would like you not to be in a place of doubt, but that doubt would move you somewhere. So some of the things that we may say is, you know, what do I do to stop doubting? I have people that ask me all the time, what causes doubt? Will I always doubt? Why would God allow me to doubt? Does doubt mean that I'm not saved? And these are questions that a lot of people have about this, and I just want to kind of explore a little bit of it. And so I think um, you may or may not know this. There's a guy in the Bible, he's known as Doubting Thomas. That's how he's known. Uh, that's a bad rap, because to me, he's not a doubter. It's not what he is. I don't think he went around everywhere, and Jesus was talking. He's like, I doubt it. I, doubt. I mean, I don't know that he was that guy. But what I do see is a guy that wanted evidence a guy that wasn't always sure, and a guy that said, I need to see something kind of before I can believe something. And so if you're with me real quick, John chapter 20, 
24 through 29. You can either read up here or look in a Bible. So it says, now Thomas, by the way, let me back up for a second. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And everybody pretty much at this point has kind of seen him, but Thomas hasn't. It's kind of where we're arriving, right? So now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the 12. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them, and though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Like, that's kind of, so I think that might be a little bit in our creep deal, but doors are locked, Jesus shows up, peace be with you. And then Jesus says to Thomas, go ahead and put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, it's because you have seen me that you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And John would go on to say, for basically this is the reason that I write this. That you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. Thomas went from someone who was doubting to all of a sudden shouting, my Lord and my God. And John said, that's why I'm writing my book. That you would come to that conclusion. That doubts would take you from here to here. And so as we look at it today, I want us to look at a couple of things about, about Thomas. And so first of all, I want us to look that questions precede doubt. Precede means they come before, right? Questions come before. They're before doubt. There's these things that happen. Right? And so um, I think it'll come up on the screen a little bit. Questions precede doubt. In other words, Thomas had seen some things. Everything had been good, but his entire world just got rocked. For three years, he's left everything. He's left family. He's following. And they go to Jerusalem where Jesus is supposed to be hailed as the Messiah, lifted up as the son of David, become the new king. Everything on a Sunday was going according to plan. And by Friday, his best friend had been tortured and murdered. And now they're sitting there in a locked room, scared that it's going to happen to them. He has questions. Things happened to him. And questions usually are the things that lead to doubt. By the way, questions may lead to doubt. They don't always lead to doubt. But they can lead to doubt. And there's things that are questions, things like this, because feelings confuse. Experiences disappoint. People disappoint. Information influences us. Beliefs get challenged. Life becomes difficult. All of those things create for us questions. And as I said before, what you do with it matters. It either, when those questions come, it can be a killer to your faith or a catalyst to your faith. I remember a time when I'm a brand new believer, that means I have come to faith in Christ and I'm my most excited. I am like loving Jesus. And it's about one or two in the morning and I'm sitting on some steps in my town home at LSU and I am praying for about 50 of my friends praying for their wives, for children. I'm praying, asking God how he could intervene, how I could make a difference. Praying, asking for ways in which I could get involved in their lives. And in the middle of all of that, I stop and say, God, I'm not sure that I'm saved. And I literally say, God, if I've never, if I've never given my life to you, then may, I, then may I do that now. May I do that now. And, and here's why that happened. Because feelings create questions. 
And one of the things that we get lost in is my feelings then, even though I was praying for people, desperate for them to come to know Christ, worried that they wouldn't, I didn't feel saved. And it led me to doubt. And it led me to call out to God and say, if I've never been saved, save me. Save me again, save me. And then I begin to realize, wait a second, here I am at one and two in the morning, praying for people, desiring that they would know Christ, escape judgment, that they would know the goodness of who he is. And I'm pleading with God that they would know him. And you know who does not plead with God for others to know him, lost people? It dawned on me, of course I'm saved. What, what lost person is begging God that his friends would be saved, that they would know to come him? And so in that moment, there were real questions, real, real things that led me to be really confused, and, and it really caused doubt. But it could be a catalyst, or it could be a killer. And I stepped out of there, and I was like, I know I'm saved. Because the Pete I knew would have never cared where someone spent eternity. Would have never cared to pray. Pete I knew didn't even know how to pray or who to pray to. And now I'm at one in the morning begging you to save my friends. Of course I'm safe. But even in that, doubt doubt crept in. For you, like things that would happen. I don't know everybody's story, but we listen to enough of them. Why, why is this the life you gave me? Why, why do I, everybody else has friends, I have none. Why, why are these the parents you gave me? For somebody like me, why is this the ADHD you gave me? Why, like, why? Why when everybody else, why do the people that don't seem to love you, things go really well for them, and I'm over here and I love you, and it's terrible. No friends, no whatever. I do everything that you ask. It doesn't play out the way that I thought. Questions like that are real, and they really lead to doubt. But the Bible continues to say this, doubt promotes investigation. Doubt promotes investigation. Doubt leads to, it should lead to you investigating. It should lead you to investigate, not evacuate. Right now we have all these people Now declare, and I'm talking about they were at Elevation Church or they were at this church or they were worship leaders or they were pastors and they're sitting on all these platforms saying, well, I was a believer, but man, I have all these doubts and the doubts led me to walk away from my faith. But real doubt in the Bible leads you to investigate, not evacuate. Jesus is the one who says, you have doubts? I encourage you to see where nails went through my body, to see where the spear came in. He asked him to investigate what happened. Christianity is not isolated. Archaeology, history, we are a faith you can study. It's not some vague, mystical, it's got roots to it. It's got history to it. It's got credibility to it. And I would challenge you if you walk through doubts now or later, have someone in your life that you trust, that you would say, no matter what happens, where I end up in life, when I have these doubts, that I end up, I'm going to write them down and I'm going to go ask somebody I trust rather than saying these doubts are confusing, I'm confusing, the whole thing must be confusing, I'm walking away. That's not the Christian faith. It has some substance to it. It's not just, oh, just believe, like people say. It's not like that. It's believe with lots of evidence behind it. There was a guy years ago. His name's Lee Strobel. Uh, He was an atheist. He worked for the Chicago Tribune, and he was an editor. And his wife got saved. 
And he was furious. And so his wife's coming home being all Jesus-y, and he can't stand it. And so you know what he decides to do? He said, I'm going to go investigate this Jesus and show her what a joke it is. And he spent all this time researching and searching about the reality and the validity of a man named Jesus who declared to be a teacher and a miracle worker. And did that hold up in history? And in history, that seemed to hold up. And history also showed that man declared to be the Son of God. That man declared to do some things. History showed that people believed that he did. And that man died on a cross like he claimed he would. And through all of his study and through all that he had, he came to the conclusion that there was enough evidence to show that there probably was a resurrection because there was enough people in history that at one time realized something. They were one way. Having met Jesus, they became another way. There was enough for him to believe this man who declared to be Messiah, declared to be God, lived it acted it, physically, really died on a cross and enough evidence to show that he rose from the dead. And he said, you know what? If somebody rises from the dead, I'll believe them. And rather than disproving Christianity, he wrote a book called The Case for Christ when he gave his life to Christ. Because Christianity, and not really Christianity, but the Christ of Christianity, that's worth investigating. I would challenge some of you in here. They're like, man, I just come here. I'll tell you what, if we're right and he's, he's the real deal and he did all these things and then he declared those who believe are saved and those that don't believe are condemned, right now I would want to investigate that. Real, real doubt promotes investigation. But here's the best part. Investigation propels faith. If you don't know what propels is, most of us know. You're like propeller, right, whatever. It means it moves it along, right? It advances faith. When we actually investigate in Christianity, it advances our faith. Like in my struggles and in my issues and all these things, I really have taken the time as a when I've been, you know, in pastors at other places and churches, I would have these different struggles. One of the weirdest struggles that I've had had to do with two issues. One of them was I was dealing with a Jehovah's Witness who wrote a letter to me because it was COVID. <laughs> so he couldn't call. I mean, he, uh, he, he wrote a letter and called. You know, normally they knock on your door and go knock on their door. They hate it. <laughs> but he mailed and called and I responded because I want to hear what he has to say. And man, as we went through the scriptures and did all this stuff, I'm more and more convinced. I know my scripture. And we were yelling. Jesus, like, why are you yelling at that man? I'm not yelling. I'm just super passionate. We got off the phone. By the way, I talked to his wife first. Like, you got to talk to my husband. I talked to the husband. He's like, you got to talk back to my wife. But when I finished it, after all of that, I had doubts. You know what my doubt was? He was challenging the deity of Christ. Now I know Christ saved my life and changed my life. And I was thinking, you know, he made some valid points. And if someone were to share some of these with you, they might get you too. Because he brought up some points like the word firstborn, that Jesus is the firstborn. Some of you in here, you're the firstborn. Like you're like, yeah, I was born first. So I just was like, I knew better. I studied it in seminary, but it bothered me. And it's like, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe like Father God did this, then he created Son, and then through everything. So, man, I just did this deep dive where for a second, I was like, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't God. Maybe, maybe I'm off here. But I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to convince somebody else. Man, I did this deep dive. I'd been a pastor. I've been a believer for years. I just convinced somebody that Jesus is Lord, and I walked away and I was like, is he? And then I realized what the word firstborn means. It doesn't mean he's the firstborn. I mean, he's the originator, the source. 
And so when the Bible says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What it means is he is the originator, and he is the source of every single thing that has been made. He not only made it, he created it, he sustains it. He's Lord. But for a second, I struggled. I remember struggling. I was with, uh, I listened to a lot of people, and I, I want to I communicate something. If in your Christian faith, you're not having some doubts somewhere along the line, you're not growing in your faith. Because doubts arise from thinking. And thinking is because you're growing. But once again, it's either going to be the catalyst or the killer because what you do with it matters. And one of the most fundamental things in Christianity is the word repentance. And I had somebody tell me, they were like, no, you're telling people to repent. That's a work. And it's by faith you've been saved. It's grace There's nothing you do. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Because I know that. And one day, for about one week, I said, maybe maybe I'm off. Maybe I've been telling everybody they need to repent. And I'm wrong because it's a work. And here I am once again, pastor, leader over stuff, teacher. And I'm struggling. And then I realized as I look, and over and over and over, and I'm like, what are they talking about? And then I realize, wait a second, sometimes it says to repent, sometimes it says have faith, sometimes it says both, and then I realize they're synonymous. Because the word repent doesn't mean to turn like we always hear. And that's what I was like, oh, turn is a work, turn is a work. No, it means to change of a mind. That I change my mind. I change my mind about who I am and who God is, and about my sin, and what he's able to do with it. And as a result of that, I realize how wicked I am, and how holy he is, and it leads me. It leads me to say, I don't want this, but I do want you. And so repentance means, man, I don't just turn to something, I turn from something, and to something, and it's necessary for salvation. Those are real doubts. Those are real things that we all struggle with. So I would challenge you real quick for a couple of things that I think is important. Here's some truths about doubt that you need to know. The positive thing is it's normal. Everybody has it, but what you do with it will determine whether it is a killer or a catalyst. And by the way, if you have doubts and you don't tell people It's either because you're afraid to find the answer or you like the new life you're living. Because Christianity has an answer. Here's what I would say, the unhealthy things. Disobedience creates doubt. If you're not walking with the Lord every single time, it'll create doubt. God, I don't know why this has happened to me. God, I don't understand this. God, I don't know what. Well, of course not. You're never walking in step with him. Of course you'll doubt. You don't experience the promises. You don't experience the victory. You don't experience the assurance. You don't experience the blessings. Of course you doubt. Distance creates doubt. We don't tell you to read your Bible to check a list. We tell you because it's a relationship. If I never saw my wife and showed up once a year, I would know very little about her and I would be very uncertain about our relationship. But the more time I spend with her, the intentional time I spend with her, I know more about her and I'm more and more convinced that she has to put up with me for the rest of her life. But I'm convinced she will. Difficulties create doubt. Of course, I realize that when you're a Christian, you can have depression 
I realize as a Christian you can have anxiety. I realize as a Christian, can, I don't, I'm going to say it this way, I don't mean it that way. You can be a terrible student even when you try. I was going to put me in the category and just say I'm dumb. Everybody else, you know, they just whiz through tests. I'd like time and a half. I was like, this is never going to work, God. But somehow he took all that craziness. He was able to put it together for one moment. But difficulties create, I mean, like, and y'all have real stuff. When parents get divorced or parents don't treat you well or parents are unbelievers or parents don't understand and you're a kid and you're living, that's a big deal. And you can question God, which is great because he's up for it. But it can be a catalyst or a killer. And bad doctrine creates that. And what I mean by that is that's bad teaching. And some of us have this idea that when we came to Christ, everything was going to work out. There was a guy named Sean McDowell. He's an apologist. If you don't know what that is, he defends the faith. And he just had an interview the other day. And he said he was meeting with one of these guys that had left and abandoned the faith. And as he was meeting with them, he tried to get into the, the, really the conversation to really see if he could try to help him come back to the faith or encourage his faith. He said at the end of the interview, I did a terrible job. I thought I blew it. But right at the end, I asked him one question. Tell me what it was like when you realized you were a sinner. Tell me that moment. And that God could be a savior to you, and he saved you. He said, tell me about it. And the guy looked at him. He said, like a deer in headlights. And he said, I didn't, I didn't come to become a Christian because I thought I was a sinner. I was told that if I came to Jesus, my life would be better, and I would feel good. And so then he knew. Wrong gospel, wrong Jesus. You didn't leave the faith. You never had the faith. That's the question that needs to be asked. And that's the question I actually need to ask you. See, that's the thing. Many of us in here, the reason you're here is your parents excellent. That's awesome. But the reason you believe pretend to believe, think you believe, it's because it's all based on your parents' faith, but not yours. And as long as it works and it feels good, and if I come to youth group, my parents trust me, they allow me to do more, I get to see my friends, as long as it's working, you're in. But the minute Jesus says, Whoever comes after me denies himself, takes up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You better love me more than all others. If you do not love me more than everybody else, you cannot be my disciple. The minute that comes, who will be the Christian? So I would ask you, and I'm going to challenge you today as you go in your groups, that if you have doubts, today you need, to, you need to realize that's a good thing if you do the right thing with it. Ask people. Man, I, I love, man, me and Clayton, we love when people ask us. Because we do all sorts of research on all these things, and we've walked through it. I'm not going to give you the answer you want to hear either. And I'm not making up one either. But I'll tell you one thing you ought to know. When you walk out of this room, because let me tell you something. At some point, you need to be able to truly doubt so you can truly believe. And what you need to truly doubt is, if you were to say truly, if the Lord Jesus Christ were to walk into this room, and tonight would be the night that he was calling me. It was my time. Every moment, he knows the moment that I would be ready to meet my Savior face to face as Savior or judge. You don't need to doubt that. You need to know that. And if you sit in this room today 
I'm telling you about a Savior who loves you, can forgive you of anything, and desires to do so, but he will not do it unless you come on his terms. His terms are repentance. I turn away from what I know. I've come to an understanding that I'm not well with God. No one's good with God. No one's righteous. Not one. And since I'm one of those people, I'm not good. And I've made a decision that my life is not going the right way. I turn from my life and I yield it to him, trusting him completely and forever. If that hasn't happened, then you need to seriously doubt that when you see a Savior, that he would be savior and not judge. When you go to your rooms today, and I'm gonna pray, for, pray in a minute, please think that way. If you walk out of here and you say, Pete, I heard you speak, and I do not know, I have some doubts that I'm a believer. I have some doubts that I know of. I have some doubts that truly, if, if it was my time and my turn, I have no idea where I'd spend eternity. I would challenge you to speak to me, some of the adults that'll be here. I wouldn't go to and just run to pizza. It's just not that good. Father, we love you. And we pray, Lord God, that your word does its work. You promise that it's alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates dividing soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It accomplishes what you desire and it achieves the purpose for which you sent it. I pray for anyone in this room that has doubts about whether or not they know you and you know them regardless of religious background, regardless of experience, if they're not sure that they're yours, give them the faith, the wisdom, and the boldness to speak to someone that they may know that they have eternal life, like 1 John 5, 13 proclaims. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all, y'all are amazing, as always. Uh, y'all, if y'all need to head out, you can go to your classes. If you need to speak to me or someone else, I'll be here with some leaders.